So we are interested in uh, rigid graphs and we're interested in embeddings in uh, some kind of space that I'm going to, um, to define. So already in, in, the, in the picture here, you have one of the main motivations of these kind of problems. Uh, we have heard a lot of motivations during the, the thematic um, program and during this week. So uh, structural bioinformatics is just one of them where we have uh, data expressing distances between atoms, between points, and we would like to reconstruct the 3D structure. So let me get to my definitions. I'm going to be interested in uh, graphs that are generically rigid, which means that uh, they admit a finite number of embeddings uh, in a space that I'm going to define just later, uh, modulo uh, rotations and translations. And um, we're interested in, in generic rigidity in the sense that the, the lengths that are specified, the edge lengths that are specified, are assumed to take generic values. In this sense, we are computing um, worst case uh, number of embeddings, right? So genericity is going to maximize the number of embeddings of uh, the graph. And uh, we're also interested in minimally rigid graphs, which means that uh, given a graph, uh, if I would uh, remove one of the edge constraints, the graph would become flexible. So when I talk of rigid graphs, I imply minimal generic rigid graph, okay? I'm not going to say the whole thing. I'm going to say rigid graphs, but I'm focusing on this kind. So, um, I assume that the Euclidean embeddings are clearly useful um, in, in uh, applications and counting them is an important problem. We would like to have um, um, exact counts and we would also like to have general bounds, asymptotic bounds in, in terms of the dimension and the number of vertices in a graph. So this is, here is my definition, a Euclidean a Euclidean embedding in general of, of, of any graph, which is uh, simple, undirected, but has weights on the edges, is a mapping of the vertices to uh, some Euclidean topology, to real space, that respects the edge lengths, which means that the um, distance of the embedded vertices should be equal to the lambda, where lambda is the weight of the edge for the edges that are given for the edges that are in the set E. Now, it turns out that um, one of the, a class of very important tools that we have in bounding the number of embeddings is um, counting algebraic roots in system of polynomials. So counting the zeros of uh, well-constrained algebraic systems. Um, but such bounds on algebraic roots uh, usually come in, in counting, uh, usually count complex roots. Um, so they count roots in, in a complex closure, in, in algebraic closure of the coefficient space. So we don't have uh, very good bounds on real roots of polynomial systems, and we don't have uh, general bounds of this type um, that could be applied uh, directly the way that I'm going to apply my complex bounds. So I would like to extend the notion of real Euclidean embeddings to the complex case. So in the complex case, I assume that every vertex is mapped to a point in complex space of dimension D. Uh, D is a parameter of the problem. And the embedded points should satisfy uh, this kind of equation down here, which is an extension of this um, length equation that I had before. So I would like the sum of the squares of the difference of the coordinates to be equal to lambda squared. Okay, so in this case, I would allow, of course, any, everything to be complex. So even the lambdas could be complex, right? Because I'm going to, to um, consider a more general problem, which is the complex uh, problem. And the count on complex solutions is going to give me an upper bound on the real solutions. It turns out that in most examples, the two counts coincide. So we do not have a lot of um, 
examples where the complex count and the real count are very far apart. Of course, it could be very well the case that the complex asymptotic bounds that we derive, one reason of the gap that they have from the lower bounds is due to the fact that we compute complex uh, counts, but it's already an important tool. So it's already an important um, approach to, to be able to, to bound well the complex solutions of an algebraic system that is going to express the embeddings in this case. So in order to go to an algebraic system, I'm going to consider the constraints that are given and the constraints are essentially the edges. So we know that if the graph is rigid in the sense that we discussed, uh, a consequence is that the edges must have a certain number equal to D times N dimension times number of vertices minus um, D plus one choose two, which is um, the way to fix the coordinate frame, okay? To, to fix and to avoid rotations and translations. And the subgraphs must satisfy the same um, kind of formula with an upper bound, with an uh, inequality. We know that in the plane, this kind of equation, the inequality over all subgraphs, V prime, E prime, leads to the famous characterization of Laman graphs, which apparently was first derived by Polash and Geiringer. Um, and in fact, I will later on focus on the planar case on D equal two, because it's much easier to explain, but our approach applies to any D. So what is important here is to, to remember is that the edges characterizing a rigid graph are roughly D, o, D times N. And this is going to lead to the first kind of bounds. So my first observation, when I, when I get to counting an, um, a number of embeddings, which I call embedding number, uh, is that the complex embeddings, the number of complex embeddings, upper bounds the number of real Euclidean embeddings, um, if I construct the, the simplest kind of system of equations, I would have one quadratic equation for every edge. So I would have um, an equation expressing the length of the edge, which is of degree two in the unknown coordinates of the vertices. So here I'm assuming, as I said, the simplest formulation, unknowns are the coordinates of the vertices. Every equation, it's a polynomial of degree two, expressing the given length. Um, how many do I have? I have roughly D times N. Each equation is degree two. So Bezu tells me uh, that the product of the degrees, of the total degrees of all these polynomials, upper bounds the number of complex solutions in the corresponding projective space, okay? But this is already an upper bound on the affine roots. So this is a very straightforward bound. I, I, I might even call it trivial, but it turns out that it was the state of the art until very recently. Um, and it is very loose because already in the plane, this gives me D, sorry, gives me two to the two N, which is four to the N power. Whereas the best lower bound in, in, uh, in the plane, even for complex solutions, is 2.5 to the nth power, roughly. And in three space, which I would, uh, the upper bound is eight to the nth power. I have about three to the nth power as a lower bound. So there is a huge gap between upper and lower bounds. There is also a gap from what I would get if I applied only Henneberg one steps to construct my graph. Uh, Henneberg one steps multiply the number of embeddings exactly by D in every step. So that in the plane would give two to the N, whereas the upper bound is, uh, sorry, uh, in the plane it would, it would give me every step would multiply by D. So I would get D to the N embeddings by applying only Henneberg one steps. D to the N is very much slower than two to the DN, okay. Many people have looked at this problem and uh, some very sophisticated math has been applied. In particular, determinantal varieties um, have been studied by Borsa and Strainu back in 2004, um, a, a very interesting paper. They, 
they employ some quite deep techniques from algebraic geometry and focusing on determinantal varieties because the varieties that we have here can, can be expressed by, by minors and determinants. So I gave you the simplest formulation of quadratic equations, but we can have equivalent algebraic systems by considering the kelly menger matrices and their minors. But despite this heavy machinery, the upper bound was not significantly improved. So asymptotically, it remained at two to the dn, which is basically the Bezu bound. Uh, Stevens and Theobald looked at um, low dimensions and they applied mixed volume, which is um, an algebraic bound for exploiting the structure and the sparseness of the algebraic system. But then again, they could not get anything asymptotically better than two to the dn. Um, however, we managed to employ some combinatorial techniques um, and a different algebraic bound, but you'll see that the main contribution of our papers has been the combinatorial uh, techniques. And we managed to get last year in collaboration with Josef Sijo and um, Vangelis Barjos is my PhD student. We managed to improve uh, the upper bound only for cases uh, for, for dimension larger than five. But using those ideas, our latest paper, which as I said, is not yet published, is going to get a, a significant improvement in every dimension that I'm going to show you um, right now. So um, one thing that we use is the multi-homogeneous Bezu bound, which of course is a very classic bound. And uh, the interesting thing here is not that this Okay, it, it does capture some kind of structure, this <laughs> homogeneous structure, but more importantly, it allows us to go to reduce the problem to a combinatorial problem, namely to counting orientations of the original graph. The original graph is a weighted graph with no orientation, it's undirected. So I'm going to forget the weights, I'm going to use the graph, so I'm going to use the edges that are given um, defining an undirected graph. And I'm going to count how many directed graphs can be defined on this uh, graph. So I'm going to discuss this later uh, during my talk. Um, okay, before I get to the um, math, let me um, go uh, very fast, sneak preview. Ah. Um, Go to page 18. So this is what we get. So the Bezu bound is the last line. The top line is the dimension. So um, in the plane, Bezu gives us four to the end. So this table shows you the base, which is raised to the nth power. I repeat, n is the number of vertices. So for Laman graphs, for instance, we know that four to the n is the upper bound derived by the Bezu's bound on the standard system or by the other attempts that have been um, around for some time. And last year with uh, Shiho, as I said, we did not improve this case, but in this paper, I'm going to show you how we can get the bound to 3.776 to the nth. And the same technique applies to other dimensions and we get 6.84 instead of eight to the nth power for 3D space and so on. You see it here, okay? So this is the topic of uh, today's talk. Okay, so as I said, my first ingredient is going to be um, an algebraic count based on multi-homogeneous Bezu bound, which is called M Bezu bound. As, as the term suggests, uh, we exploit the multi-homogeneous structure of the equation, of the equations. This means that um, um, if we split the variables into groups, we observe that the equations are homogeneous in every group of variables, in every subset of the variables. And then we can have bounds that are lower than the classic Bezu bound. 
multi-homogeneous bezu bound counts the number of roots in a product of projective spaces, depending on the structure one defines in, in these subsets of the variables. Um, it is not as tight as mixed volume for sparse systems, but it, it lies somewhere in between bezu and mixed volume. And it turns out that in our case, it's, it's pretty good because our equations are um, multi-homogeneous. So let's see um, how I advance. Next page. Okay, so let, let's consider the length equations that I already uh, mentioned, the, the simplest formulation. Um, and let's see how I'm going to write them to take advantage of this multi-homogeneous structure and reduce the problem to, to counting um, um, graph orientations. So I assume that every vertex V is embedded to some point with coordinates capital XV. So capital XV is a vector of dimension D that encodes the yet unknown coordinates of my vertex. Um, and the actual equations are here. So the equations are, as I said, it's this sum of squares of the difference. So if you, if you expand the equation um, that equals to lambda square, then one gets the sum of the coordinates squared for the, for the first vertex, u, plus the sum of the coordinates squared for the second vertex, minus two times their inner product. Okay, so this is inner product of the vectors capital X u, capital X v. Now, here, I introduce new variables, S, U, S, V, that are placeholders for the sum of squares of the coordinates. This is a very uh, powerful technique when, wants, when one wants to, um, to, to make manifest the structure of the equation. And um, mathematically, you can think of it as uh, removing some solutions at infinity. In fact, this removes solutions at toric infinity, and it works very well for decreasing the mixed volume. This is a, a trick that we actually we discussed with Stevens and Theobald, and they applied it in getting very tight mixed volumes for, um, for counting graph embeddings. Okay, so this uh, one can see it as a, a variable substitution. One substitutes this sum of squares by a new variable. Um, and now the length equations, which are the heavier equations, are bilinear in the x, u coordinates and the x, v coordinates. So in the x, u variables and the x, v variables. So um, in, in, uh, in, in applying my multi-homogeneous technique, I'm splitting my variables into subsets Every subset corresponds to the variables expressing one vertex embedding. And the equations now are um, linear in every such group of variables. Okay. Um, now it turns out that um, the edges of a certain clique KD are fixed. They do not take part in the in changing the embeddings. So I'm going to consider the graph edges without the edges of the fixed clique. And um, the multi-homogeneous Bezu theory tells me that in order to count roots in this algebraic system that I've written up here, I need to create a new polynomial with some placeholder variables that I call Y because they correspond to the capital X variables. And the coefficients of this new polynomial correspond, correspond to the degrees of the capital X variables encountered in the original system. So because this capital X has degree two, I use two as a coefficient. And because the capital X variables here have degree total degree one per set of variables, I'm using them linearly. And the theory tells me, the Embezu theorem tells me that I have to consider this polynomial, which I simplify in the right-hand side. And now the coefficient 
in this polynomial of the product of powers y1 to the d plus 1 times yn to the d plus 1 is an upper bound on the number of roots of the system. So this is the end, the zoo bound um, for the original system. And in fact, I, I, I consider the coefficient of the whole expression, which is the coefficient of this product in the product of products times a power of two. Okay, because I've simplified this uh, writing. So here I'm stating the Embezu theorem applied to my system of equations. And what we observe, ah, somehow, okay. Um, and what we observed um, um, in the paper with uh, Josef uh, Siho is that um, if we construct this system and we look at the coefficient, we can simplify a little bit the discussion and look at this coefficient in this kind of um, polynomial, then um, this coefficient is going to give me the number of orientations in the graph, uh, in the input graph, where um, I require that every vertex outside this fixed clique has an out degree D. So I count how many ways, in how many ways can I impose a directed graph on top of my given undirected graph, such that the out degree of every vertex is exactly D. The number of such orientations, I call them graph orientations, the, the number of ways of creating directed graphs with this constraint equals uh, the solutions of, those, of that system, okay, which corresponds to the number of embeddings. So I'm reducing the number of embeddings to counting graph orientations. And why graph orientations equal this multi-homogeneous bound? Because I'm considering the way that this coefficient is defined inside the expansion of this expression. And I observe that every set of variables, capital Y, that correspond, so, um, okay. Yeah, every set of variables, capital Y, that corresponds to one vertex, embedded with coordinates capital X contributes to the monomial that I'm looking at only once for every edge. And because I have D of those, uh, that's why I need out degree D. And um, yeah, ev every such set of variables for, for one vertex contributes a total of D times, exactly D times. Okay, that gives me the constraint that every vertex must have out degree D in the orientation. Okay, so this is the crucial step to get to a combinatorial problem counting orientations. It turns out that in the paper with uh, Josef Siho, we did not manage to fully exploit it to get much better uh, upper bounds on the number of embeddings. As I said, we got an improvement only for D uh, larger or equal to, to, to five. And actually we had one more ingredient in that proof. We looked at permanence, matrix permanence, whose value is connected to the multi-homogeneous Bezu bound. In the new version, we don't need permanence, but we need a more refined view in the combinatorics in counting orientations. So let's see what is the version. So this is basically a theorem. I call it a lemma because for today, the main result is, is, is the next one. And uh, so this is how we apply that theorem to our case. So I'm going to start with a rigid graph G. I'm going to consider any fixed click. The choice of the fixed click will affect the bound at the end. For Laman graphs, this click is just an edge that I have to fix from the origin to the first vertex, let's say. Um, and then I define a new uh, graph G prime. So G prime is, contains the same vertices, but fewer edges. I have to delete the edges of uh, the fixed click. And I'm going to count the orientations of the new uh, graph, which, as I said, have constraints on the out degree, namely that every vertex that remains um, uh, in the graph uh, 
besides the fixed click uh, has out degree exactly D. The um, out degree of the fixed uh, vertices must be zero. So fixed vertices are these D vector vertices in the fixed click. And by the previous lemma, this is connected to the embedding number by this relationship. So if I manage to bound the number of orientations capital B, I will multiply by an exponential T2 to the N minus D, and I will have an upper bound on the embeddings. Okay, so the question here is how to bound the number of orientations capital B, okay, for a given choice of a fixed click. So this is an example. I take the desired graph. I fix the, the, the edge that is uh, dashed. Um, and I count the number of orientations with the constraints that I mentioned. And there are exactly two such orientations. So B equals two. Therefore, the upper bound is two times the power of two yields 32, where we know that actually the number of real and complex embeddings is 24. So I'm getting upper bounds with this approach. Um, let's see how we, I can give you in five minutes a, a gist of the method uh, focused on Laman graphs. So when I throw out um, this fixed click, I'm going to end up with a graph that is missing some edges. And in the, I'm going to define an elimination process where I'm going to um, reduce the number of vertices and while I'm eliminating vertices, I'm going to be counting the orientations that are uh, defined based on that vertex. So at the end of the process, I will have uh, the total number of orientations. Intuitively, I have a bound on the orientations that depend on that vertex. I delete it. And then I have a bound on the orientations of the remaining graph and I take the product. So inductively, the product of this um, partial bounds is a bound on the total number of orientations of the original graph. So these steps are steps in the elimination process that is going to create what I call pseudo graphs. The reason that I have to deal with pseudo graphs is that sometimes we delete a vertex and what happens to each edge? When I, when I have an edge and one only one vertex is deleted, the edge remains as a hanging edge. I call it hanging edge if it has only one vertex and no second vertex. The hanging edges are necessarily directed outward from the remaining um, vertex of theirs. Okay, so the pseudograph is going to contain vertices, is going to contain standard edges, which I call normal, defined by two vertices, and it's going to, it's going to contain hanging edges. It must always be connected and I can, I can uh, consider uh, for every vertex its total degree, which is standard edges and hanging edges, its hanging degree, and of course the normal degree is the difference of the two, or uh, otherwise stated the total degree is the sum of normal degree and hanging degree. So for every uh, vertex, I have to remember its total degree P and its hanging degree H. So I have this pair that characterizes um, um, vertices. Uh, this is an example. So if I start with, um, with this graph and I remove the fixed edge, I end up with a pseudo graph, which is here. And I have to um, apply this elimination process to, those, to this pseudo graph. And the elimination process, as I said, is going to count uh, orientations gradually until it gets to a um, base case. So it's like an induction that gets to a base case. And the base case is going to be a tree that admits zero or one orientations, basically, and uh, uh, constrained orientations, right? Orientations where um, graphs have, uh, uh, vertices have um, um, out degree D or a degree two here. Um, okay, so this is an example how we de define a pseudo graph. And uh, we wish to count the orientations. I also call them valid orientations, those that satisfy this, um, this constraint on the out degrees. Um, 
Okay, and this uh, slide uh, gets, now I have a, a few slides, three or four, I think, on the technical aspects of this elimination process that removes one vertex at a time. Um, in some cases, I am allowed to remove L vertices if they form a path and they are of the proper degree. So uh, this is the case of three comma one vertices, total degree three, hanging degree one. Uh, in every case, when I eliminate L vertices, I also delete two L edges from that adjacent to that vertex, okay? Um, the deleted edges are the edges that I decided to orient outwards from the removed vertex. That's why uh, this deletion step is like counting orientations because it's like fixing the orientation for, the, for these two outward vertices. And then if I fix it, I delete that, uh, that vertex. And I count essentially in how many ways can I fix the orientations around this vertex. I remember this count, I forget the edge, and then I go to the smaller subgraph, to the new pseudograph. Okay, this is the, the idea. This, this, the number of orientations that I have during a specific step is called the cost of the step. So the product of costs bounds the orientations capital B that I need. This is the base case that I mentioned where I end up with a tree. Um, and then we, we have lemmas that derive um, um, bounds on the cost for a single vertex elimination the cost of a path elimination, which is always two. Uh, of course, I'm not going to go into any detail. Um, I have some um, examples here, but maybe I should uh, wrap up to get some uh, time of questions. Maybe I'll use a couple of minutes more if uh, nobody in, um, has any question right now. So here I give an example of eliminating a vertex that has three normal edges and no hanging edges, hence of degree three comma zero. Um, and when I delete this um, vertex, as I said, I delete two edges because two edges are fixed with orientation outside this vertex and there remains one edge. So I have three choices of which edge remains. Therefore, I have to take into account these three generated um, pseudographs. The edges in these cases, in every case, they are hanging. And uh, basically, this is the cost of this elimination step. Okay, this is the number of orientations I'm getting at this deletion step. Um, I have also the example of 3,1 vertex, where this vertex already has a hanging edge and another two normal edges. Um, it has two possible outcomes after deletion of the vertex. And uh, this is obtained by our formula, which is this binomial coefficient. And I also give you an example of a path elimination. As I said, we eliminate paths of consecutive three comma one vertices, and they always lead to two possible uh, pseudographs that I have to treat in the next step. So here you may say that this gives me a, a, a disconnected graph, but I'm all, only focusing on a part of the graph. I assume that uh, the graph remains connected, but there is a lot of vertices and edges that I do not see here. So I'm focusing on the eliminated vertices. Um, uh, so uh, I'm getting uh, close to my conclusion. Uh, th this is uh, the table I showed you before. Um, the upper bounds are always of the form B to the power of N where n is the number of vertices in the rigid graph, and b must be as small as possible, of course. Uh, Bezu, so maybe we, we should read the, the table um, bottom upwards. Bezu had two to the d as a basis. Um, our first approach uh, slightly improved it, actually improved it from d larger or equal to five, but the new combinatorial uh, technique that I just outlined manages to improve the, the Bezu bound for the first time below two to the D, everything to the end. And these are the numbers, of course, it applies to any dimension and, and, and it goes on, this table goes on. Um, we have a paper on archive uh, 
that has much more details, of course, and a bigger table. It's interesting to notice that uh, people for the past few years have been in this topic for more for a few decades now. So it seems that um, topics that started like five or six years ago are, are kind of new to me. Spherical embeddings um, uh, turn out to be um, an area of study and we can apply our methods to spherical embeddings and we get the same bounds. Okay, so I think this is also very interesting. Um, uh, let me try to conclude. Uh, these are the papers I mentioned. The one with Joseph was uh, published in uh, JAACC um, last year. Um, the current one is submitted to DCG. And as I said, there is an archive version from last year. And we are working with um, um, master student, Harada Bosjamos here to further improve these bounds. We already have some results but I did not want to get to very technical details. I'll conclude with um, pictures of some further applications because I think this topic is very exciting because it combines math and very useful um, real world uh, problems. Thank you for your attention. Any questions are welcome. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you, Yanis, for um, a really interesting talk and like a very um, nice result. So so I can see actually that, that um, Walter already has his hand up. So, um, so Walter. There are overlap, at least in the techniques of uh, directed graphs with two parts of the literature, one of which is assured decompositions of pinned graphs, which comes from mechanical engineering. And there's some literature, some good characterizations in the plane and some extent other literature in higher dimensions. The other place where we routinely use these two directed uh, or three directed or whatever graphs is whenever we're computing a pure condition. Each of the directions produces a term in the, in the essentially the Laplace decomposition of the matrix. So th that's two pieces of literature that would be worth at least comparing to see what is available or not. One of the nice things is that Maple and Sage have built in algorithms for finding uh, the directed graphs for a the direct the two direction or three direction graphs for a given thing and two different um, set of directions are equivalent by reversing a directed cycle. So you can look a little at that literature if you want. You can contact me to see a bit more, but it's just that it is being used in other parts of rigidity theory. Yes, yes, thank you very much. I will contact you because I took some notes, but maybe not very complete. Yeah, of course it's used. We, we already use some lemmas from graph, theorem, graph theory, such as the block cut tree. Yes. Um, it's also reminiscent to, to some, um, uh, yes, yes, uh, some uh, work that I have seen, I forget the name, but uh, you're right, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to look at that. Thank you very much. Just, it's, it, it, the origin of Ashir graphs was about 1910, a Russian mechanical engineer trying to decompose his mechanism into small components, each of which would have an algebraic equation, and he could handle the small ones if he could break the thing up so that it became sequential, solve this algebra, solve this algebra, and then you could describe the paths of the mechanism. So that the name Ashur comes from a Russian uh, mechanical engineer. <laughs> okay, good, good. Okay, so um, the next question, so Bill has his hand up. Bill? Thanks, Lewis. Yeah, so I th thank you for the talk. I thought it was. I also thought it was really good. Um, so I have a, maybe a silly question, and it's: What do you do when d is greater or equal to three? Because you seem to want to start off with a complete graph. So from from the given rigid graph, we fix um, a clique k d, which is then uh, removed from consideration. Um, and then the same techniques carry on in, in arbitrary dimension. 
but of course we have to replace two by d. So for instance, but, but what, we are looking what, at- Sorry, well, what happens if your original graph doesn't have a clay? Yes, okay, that's a good question. Um, so uh, we discussed this in the paper. Um, yes, it turns out that um, in almost all interesting cases, there is a clique and we can find it, but indeed it's, uh, it's something, yes, we, it's something that we have to take care of at the beginning of the, of the process. Yes, I did not discuss it, it's a bit technical, uh, as I said, we argue about it in the paper and we give reference to other works that in most or all known cases, this works, but it's one of the um, assumptions. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so other questions? Let, let me add one thing that we discussed uh, with the, uh, before. Pebble Games is uh, what I wanted to say, is a very similar um, approach, with, uh, is reminiscent. So we, we get inspired by Pebble Games, we reference in the paper, I did not mention it, yes. Okay, that's, that's very cool. So I was also going to ask if, um, if, if somehow like, so you start with some, some given, mostly out degree D orientation. And then I guess a way of moving between them is, is somehow doing cycle reversals. Um, did you try cycle reversals? Can you get any combinatorial results out of them? That's a good question. Um, we played with cycle reversals when we're experimenting with uh, that in order to arrive to that formulation. Um, I don't see any immediate connection the way it's now, but uh, we did consider it when we were experimenting different things, but it might give, I don't know if it could give some improvement. Uh, by the way, I'm sure that the method can be improved because it's kind of fresh and I I'm sure we have not explored it fully. Uh, I don't know if cycle diverses is, is the way to go, but uh, it, it might no. be worth to examine. So, uh, so I see that, that Chava unmuted himself and Walter has his hand up. So I'll let you guys uh, discuss. Um, just the circle reversals can be used to, you can decompose the graph into strongly connected components given one of the orientations. And that sort of at least gives you, separates it up into a nice sort of lattice and you can do the components one at a time, which probably some can give you some kind of uh, uh, reduction in, in bound because you'd probably have a bound for each component. 